Alright, uh, today is May the 6th, 7th, 7th, 7th. excuse me, May 7th, 7th at 9.49 at the Mooresville Public Library and we're doing an oral history interview with uh, Henry T. Sink, S-I-N-K. Okay. Uh, start off and tell us a little bit about you and your early life and how you got involved with the, what made you go into the fire. You want me to uh, tell you how old I am to start with? Do that, yes, that'd be good. So when I have these senior moments. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I turned 82 in March. And uh, when I went on the fire department, uh, I was uh, working for my father, and he owned the board of the laundry and dry cleaning at uh, the corner of states with an iron lab. I've been working for him since I came out of the service in 1947. And uh, I was originally was raised in Lutheran, and the Lutheran church is where the fire station is now today, the number one station on Main Street. Okay. And the Masonic Hall back there was an educational building for the Lutheran church. And uh, when I was about 30 years old, we changed over and went to the Methodist Church on Academy Street, uh, Central Methodist Church. And uh, Central Methodist Church was loaded with volunteer farmers. <laughs> Chief Troutman and, and Fred Hudson and Sam Deaton and on and on, I can name them all that went to the uh, Methodist Church there. And one day I was working there in the dry cleaning. I was actually around the dry cleaning uh, plant. And these guys walked in and had my dad, and they walked back there and said, We want to talk to you. Would you be interested in being on the board for the volunteer fire department? Well, I didn't even really, I knew more from Bound to have a fire department, but I wasn't connected in any way with it. So. That's where it started. And of course, what they had to know from my dad, will you let him leave the job to go to a park? And that was the deciding factor. Wow. And after they left, dad says, you know, I think you would really enjoy being a part of that. The men always seem like they're uh, real close to each other. And he said, I think that's something you would enjoy doing. So I decided, decided at that time that I'd give it a try. And that's how I got on the volunteer fire department. And that was sometime in the, uh, say, 57, somewhere along there. And I can't really pinpoint it. And uh, in 1962, my dad decided he could no longer stay in that business and he had an opportunity to go to the state of North Carolina uh, in the prison system as a professional launderman. They had laundry set up in some of the prisons, especially the one at Craig in a uh, prison in Asheville. And he told me one Friday, which was the day we kind of closed down, that he was uh, he was going to close it up because he couldn't sell it. It was not a, not something that you could put on the market and sell. And uh, he says, "I'm telling you, I don't know when, but within the next few months or so, I'm going to close down." And he says, "You need to be hunting you something to do." And I said, "Dad, I know where I can get a job today." And I got in my old station wagon and drove over to Town Hall and they were looking for a uh, communications man and at that time the job was uh, fire department and police department. We were actually sworn in police officers and had power of arrest but we were trained in the fire service because we had to know how to drive the trucks and, and answer the calls and this kind. And so I went in there, and Finn Horton was the city manager at that time, and I went upstairs, and Lloyd Shoemaker was the chief of police, and Pete Pender was the 
man that ran the fire department, although it was a volunteer fire department and Chief Troughton was the man on the scene, you know, at the fires. And they hired me and Mr. Bullock and asked me, he says, why in the world would you come to work for the town of Mortal for $260 a month when you've been in a family business? And I said, well, the family business is not all that great, you know, and the pay is basically the same and no benefits. No vacation time, no holiday time, no sick leave time, no insurance. And when you went to work for the town, they furnished you with shoes and everything to the top of your head. Bring you to work, had transportation to work, had uh, health insurance. And at that time, they did not have a retirement plan, but within about three years, uh, when uh, Cyrus Brooks was the city manager, they uh, grandfathered all the old guys like Ralph Eaton. He had about 38 years in it. And, and uh, I was trying to think, but Russell Sherwood, the yeah. water department, was had all 36, 37 years they've been. And they grandfathered them into the retirement. That's when we got our retirement. Wow. Okay. Uh, talk about Mountain Lake and how well, it fits in. They had this property down there, and Andy, I do not know how they got this house, but it was on uh, the Davison Cove when you went into uh, uh, the boat landing where uh, Joe. Kiesler, I believe his name was, he lost the leg there he had, uh, in a boating accident, but he ran a boat oh, yeah. Yeah. And when he went out of there, he turned to the right and went right straight into the body and turned to the right and went down into the Davidson Creek Arm and the, and the uh, fireman's house was down there. And we all pitched in. We had painters, carpenters, people that knew how to do everything. And on days off when we wasn't working, we'd go down there and we'd paint them and uh, put it in good shape, built a nice pier, put lights on the place to sleep. And they had a system that you would sign a book uh, for your family to come. And Jim Torrance was a paid farmer at that time. He started off as a volunteer, but he was a paid farmer at that time, and we were close to his family, my two children, and he had uh, three girls and one boy, his four children, and he lived right there on Church Street. And uh, so we signed it together, and we'd go down there and spend the weekend, get it for Saturday and Sunday, and fish off the pier and took hamburgers and stuff, you know, and spend our nights there, and everybody, bought, everybody loaned and took furniture from their homes to furnish the place just with chairs and beds and that kind of stuff. And it was a real nice, it was a real treat back in those days. This was before Lake Norman and Mountain wow. Island was a place to go. Good fishing, you know. Wow. We really enjoyed it. <laughs> wow. Uh, now these other guys that you're going to interview can tell you what happened to that. Like Dean was just telling you they finally took the money that they received from it and put it into a fund and all this. But I don't, I don't know anything about that. That happened after I was through using it. Tell a little bit about the uh, old call system, how fires were, how people reported fires and then called <laughs> in. And well, I like to say I was actually, they call them per public service officers now, but in that day and time we were uh, in the communication. We had uh, radio contact with the highway patrol, and we had radio contact with the local police departments, Statesville, Harlan County, Mooresville, Newton, Lincolnton, uh, Taylorsville, and we were all on the same frequency. And on Saturday night when the fire trucks was and the fire service was on the same radio frequency with the police departments and the sheriff's departments and the highway patrol. And so on Saturday night when things were really going, it was uh, just 
you could not believe the traffic that was coming through these speakers that we had. And I remember our call was KIB 982. Salisbury was KIB 896. The city government was KBF 258. The fire department was KIB. KIKW, I believe, uh, 366 were the call. Things for the, and you had to keep all of this stuff. Lincolnton was on there, and the sheriff's department was on there, and the fire departments. You could hear the trucks going out of the barn with the states and the sirens going in the dispatcher, telling them where the fire was and all that stuff. And Thankfully, at some point in time, people realized that this was just not working real good, and they changed the frequencies for the highway patrol and the fire departments and the police departments and the sheriff's departments, and everybody got their own frequencies. And they installed a system uh, called uh, inter interdepartmental or inter community system and it was like a dial phone and you could dial that thing and it would switch the frequency to the department that you were calling that was not on your frequency. So we still maintain good radio contact because of high speed chases and fires where you had, uh, where you needed uh, help from other departments and uh, so it worked out. And of course, I don't know what the system is now. I have no earthly idea. <laughs> I know it's so sophisticated. We're 800, 800 megahertz now. Oh, yeah. Where, where a walkie-talkie you used to have what looked like a brick. Oh, yeah. You, you now they're a lot smaller and they cost a lot, lot more. You know, where a basic walkie now is $5,000 for just walkie-talkie. Your back was bent over with those things. And uh, it was... Uh, it was really something. It really was. But uh, things change. It changed for the better. I guarantee you they did. What's your most memorable moment with the fire department? My first fire. My first fire. And I was, uh, my insurance hadn't come in. Charlie Trapman had sent in, and he told me, he said, do not answer the fire alarm. And uh, I was living on Magnolia Street, and I heard the alarm go off. That old system was uh, set on top of the roof up there, and it, it uh, would blow the count out, say like number 12 was across the street from the city hall where. And that thing would go boom, and it paused and it'd go boom, boom, and then it would repeat itself. It had four times that it blew out that number 12. Well, if you were a volunteer fireman, wherever you were working or at home in bed, whatever, when you heard it, you counted that thing and you got in your vehicle and you went to the scene of the fire because that's where it was at. And the old system worked by a call box on the pole and you open the door, pull the lever down, and if it was number 12, it came into the police, uh, police department and the fire department there. It was a long uh, box about like this. It had a tape run through it, and it'd punch out one. And then it'd punch out one, one, it'd punch out 12, four times, it'd punch it out on that tape. And the firemen, when they, if it just came in on that box, see, they had no prior knowledge except that. Now the other system was was the call ins on the telephone. And when they called in the man at the desk in the communication, like myself, mm -hmm. would say fire department and of course they most of the time they were very, very upset. Sometimes you couldn't manage hard to even because they were just hysterical. People, when your house is on fire, you really upset. Or your car or whatever it was, or an accident. 
and we had our roller decks there, and whatever the street number was, the closest thing to that call box, we flip over the roller decks. We'd step outside and we had these little wheels that had notches on them. And you inserted that thing in that system on a peg, pulled the handle down, and it did the same thing it did when you pulled it at the pole. It would go, and then the old horn up over would go, boom, 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 you know, for 12. Mm -hmm. And uh, it got really complicated when they put in the uh, master boxes out on what we call Plaza Drive now, and at that time it was 150 bypass. We had Draymore, Tim Pond, Jim Spun. And they had master boxes that worked on the uh, pressure system, and when the pressure dropped, even though they didn't even have a fire, it would blow out their numbers, and they were triple digit numbers like 275. So that thing would go boom, boom, and then pause and then it blew seven more times and then pause and blew five times. Very, very confusing to some of the volunteer firemen. They never could, they couldn't, they couldn't walk and chew gum at the same time, you know, and they get up in the middle of the night in their sleep and they come to the fire station. Where is that fire? I couldn't count that. What, what is that thing doing? <laughs> But you got used to all that stuff over here. But getting back to my first fire, I heard that thing go off and I knew it was on Main Street. And I heard trucks running and sirens running and more sirens running and more trucks running. To see right there on my, uh, the high point of Mooresville at that time was the Low Ranch Hospital. They call it Eastern Heights and that was the low highest that elevation in town. And I could hear all this, and I said, I'm going to have to go up there and see what's going on, although Charlie told me not to come. So when I walked up, the trucks was hooked up down at the Baptist Church, and they was hooked up on Broad Street, and they was hooked up to the Hydrants on uh, Main Street, and they were calling for mutual aid to Statesville and, and Trapman and to bring pumpers. And it was a dime store fire. And now where Cerise at, that was Morrow Brothers. Mm -hmm. And there was two buildings there. They had an appliance place and a furniture place. And that dime store building was separated from those two buildings with a big firewall. And that's the only thing that kept us losing that whole block. And when I got there, Charlie told me, he says, your insurance had to come in and don't get hurt. Don't get on the ladders. Don't get up on the roof. <laughs> Go back there in the back and they need you to sit on a two and a half inch hose. We had those things coiled around and we just sat on them and one on the nozzle. And the story was after the next day we finally got it out uh, and under control, but they were in there all the next day even up till dinner time that they pumped over a million gallons of water in that building, in that basement. And when I got there that night, it was coming out of the top floor, shoe mouth deep and running down the gutters, the water was. Uh, and you talk about engines pumping now, and that was my first fire <laughs> all night long and holding those big old hoses and I about the same size I am now, I weigh about 145 now. I think then I weighed 135 soaking wet. <laughs> And at that time, I was a smoker. Most all of us were. I couldn't raise my hands any higher than that to get my cigarettes on. <laughs> I mean, it was nothing. Oh, I imagine Cam's been there. I'm sure he's ever been hooked up on a two and a half inch hose with his son. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we had one little guy on one of the fires. Now, this is a story when the high school caught on fire way back yonder. And Bill Cabins was uh, fueling home cabins. And he was like me. He was a heavyweight. <laughs> and he had to straddle the hose. And they, Charlie and them laughed. Charlie Trouton and them laughed to the day all them old guys died. They could see Bill had a hold of that hose and the nozzle. 
and they have way too much pressure on those things. Those little two and a half inch hoses work better about 60 pounds to 80 pounds, not over that, because it took too many men to hold it. You know? And he was riding that thing. He looked like he was in a rodeo. <laughs> he was off the ground. It was just going down. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's funny stuff that happens. You know? But that was my first fire. And I went home and I was beat up bad and had to go to work, you know, and then they had a relight and I had to go back and and I asked some of the guys. Of course they didn't even know me. Nobody there even knew who I was. And uh, they and I just asked them, I said, I saw the fire's gonna be like this. I don't believe I can handle this. <laughs> Now that dime, now what was the name of the dime store? Uh, you know, I don't really know. Okay. I know the building was belonged by, belonged to the Sloops. You remember that Hugh Sloop and uh, yes. Seth Gable? Yes. Was married to Libby. And he had pianos and stuff in there. And they sold pianos, a music place. Okay. And, uh, but it wasn't destroyed. It was, you know, it's back in service. And, uh, but it was a fire. <laughs> they had that old 1921 American La France with a thousand gallon a minute pumper on straight gear and pump, you know, it was perfect. And, and that thing would pump anything that come out of the hide and went in that pump. Sand, gravel, pieces of brick, rock, anything, it made no difference. And it was sucked water where there was no water. I never will forget the guy over at, uh, at fire school one time. Guy at uh, High Point, the chief was a uh, keynote speaker at graduation day, and he says, Any of you guys got any of them old Merkel of France pumpers? And of course, Charlotte was just full of them. They had them backed up. In every station had one of them. Old open cab thing, but Lord, would they pump water, and they would pump day after day. All you had to do was keep gas on keep gas in them, hook to the water. And a man walked around with a can and all the valves, big old external valves on it. He knows about that truck. He's sitting down there in the museum. It's a beautiful thing. It looks better now than it did the first time I ever saw it. And they would pump for a week. Never got tired. They just opened up a radiator cap on it. And the water off the hydra went through the radiator system and washed out. Now it was messy. You needed boots, you know, when it was pumping because it was water all around that thing, but they'd never give up. Wow. And they had that thing was hooked up at that fire. Wow. <laughs> what, what, did, what was the funnest thing that you enjoyed about being a fire? Uh, the camaraderie and the, and the people. We had people from all ages and all walks of life. And when we went, it was a uh, brotherhood. Something I miss today. Never, <coughs> I've never been that close to something in my life. You know, it was just, uh, I can't really describe it. But um, whatever the job was, we tried to do it, and uh, we worked together, and maybe didn't like each other sometimes. You know, there's always personality things and everything, but when time came and the push come to shove, we were all there for each other. I remember one night uh, we had a fire on uh, Center Avenue, and the snow was so deep, and it had snowed so much, and the town had scraped, and the intersections they had piled up, snow and the uh, ice, it was cold, and the intersections were blocked, and I was living on Magnolia Street, Paul Martin lived across the street from me, and he called and he says, we got to go, Henry, but I don't know whether we can go, but Richard's here, my, his son is home from the service, and he'll drive us, and if you'll come over and get in the car, we'll try to turn down Magnolia Street and turn to the right with a running start and get up that hill. And down the hill and up past Church Street, and then it'll be level going from there into uh, uh, Center Avenue. 
and got over there. Mr. Dozer was actually, he was a, a machine shop man at uh, North Iron Works. It was his house, and it had a malfunction on the furnace. The house was full of smoke. And when I got there, Ralph Levy and Pete Pender were the paid men there. Pete was operating the uh, pump, and Ralph had pulled the hose, had hooked to the hydrant, and pulled the hose, and the house was on the left side going west, and it was high, high steps and everything. But when we got there, I got out of the vehicle, and Ralph was going up the steps with the hose, and it was charged. It had way too much pressure on it. And back those days, we didn't have quick release nozzles on our hose where you could cut them on and off. We had a lot of uh, inch and a half hose had a screw like an old garden hose. And when I got up there, the hose was up over Ralph's head. And of course, he was a big man. And he had a hold of it. And I got behind him to get the hose to get it down on the floor so it could set on it. And Ralph had uh, bad breathing problems and he got choked and he turned it loose and there I was. <laughs> but Paul Marr was a big tall man and he came behind me and we got the hose down and got it cut off. And uh, But the reason I'm telling you this story is because of the 30 men on that fire department, I think the Mortal Tribune came out that week and says, uh, can you believe the loyalty and the bad weather condition that 28 or 29 of those volunteer fire department men showed up at that fire? And those adverse conditions. Wow. That tells you something. Yes. What was your most memorable or biggest fire? Or the one you couldn't believe? A fire. Mm -hmm, of a fire, or or accident, or whatever, just something you couldn't believe that. Well, we went to accidents where we had people burned up, and they had to take them out in pieces. And it's all, always horrible to go to a fire where you have a fatality and smell you never forget it. And um, the hottest fire I ever went to was Mr. Troutman's, Charlie Troutman's lumber yard. They had a building that was not connected with the main buildings that they had an old dried lumber stack that they used for furniture making. And that thing caught on fire and when I got there uh, the McLean boys had a, a store at Main and Statesville Avenue and that's where I parked. And when I went across the street the truck were already there and hooked up. And it was so hot that at some point you couldn't get any closer because it was a wall of heat come off of that building and it would just scorch your clothes. And we had got a hook of some sheets of tin metal plyboard that was stayed behind to use those big hoses and what we were trying to do was not so much put the fire out, it was to contain it so they wouldn't lose their whole business. And uh, we accomplished that, but that was the hottest fire that I ever went to. Wow. And of course, like when you go and people were so upset and, and you do the best you can try to console them. I don't know of anything much worse than for somebody to leave there the thing he's got right in front of his eyes. And one little story, just to kind of, and I did not see this, this was before my time, but this was an old story that circulated through the guys, you know. This woman had spent the whole summer in her garden and canning her produce in ball mason jars and had them full of her vegetables and her fruit and everything and she was so proud of it. It was a two-story house and it was pretty much on fire. It was, you know, it was burning. 
And she was upstairs on the second floor. And she had all this stuff laid out in an empty room where she had doors so she could store her produce for the winter. And the only thing that she could think of is that she was saving her hard work and her winter food. And she was tossing ball mason jars out of second store winter onto the ground. And of course, every one of them was exploding as soon as they hit the ground. And it was it wasn't funny to the men, but it was yeah. but just people do such strange things. And just this week that young man lost his life. He looked so they say he went after his dog. Yeah. Speaking of strange, what's the strangest thing you remember uh, outside the ball jars? <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you one of the funny stories, one of my funny stories was uh, a call came in on the telephone and uh, it was on Magnolia Street, right off of our lab, you turned south on Magnolia Street, it was on the left. And Buck Gasky ran the floors across the alleyway there. The two paid men got in the truck, and this is over 51 Ford I'm talking about. This is Ford. We had to be high with the walk the shovel and water's pump, you know, the first custom truck we had. We had the 38, and we didn't ever get on that 38 unless it was an emergency. <laughs> and, the, and the old American of France was so hard to get out of the barn, you had to take two or three people to turn the wheels and get it, you know, to get it out. So the 51 was the truck. And, uh, Barney Goodman was, uh, had been fireman and water department and, and police officer. And he was back in the uh, water department. All of this was connected. And I jumped on the tailboard and Buck come across and jumped on the tailboard and when we went by the water department there where the gas pump was at to go down and hit Church Street, Barney jumps on the tailboard. He said, hey, let's go, let's go. Ho, ho, where are we going, where are we going? Well, when we turned to the left on uh, our avenue, I said, we're going to your house. Well, he thought I was kidding. About halfway up the hill, he was still, just like this, on that rod across our hill. Hee-haw, you know, says, where are we going? I said, Barney, we're going to your house. And the color just drained out of his face because he realized that we was headed straight to his house. And when we topped the hill, that old truck was tough going up our avenue, and it couldn't get up speed until you passed Statesville Avenue and level out a little bit. It dawned on him that I was not kidding that we were going to his house. And all at once he says to them, Ting beans! He left a pot of beans on the store. He said, Don't throw any water in that house. He says, I'll take care of it. Boy, when it just slowed up enough to stop, he piled off of that thing and went around the back door. And out the back he went with that pot of dried beans he left on the store. <laughs> Big fire, but a funny story. <laughs> Stuff that like that happened all the time. Kept you going, you know. Oh man! But the, but the, but being part of something, only thirty people in the whole entire Damn. population of more belong, and it mm. was. Something you'll never forget. I miss it every day. <laughs> How long did you do it? Uh, four or five years as a volunteer and about three years as a paid uh, person. Still part of the police department. And I had a decision to make and uh, they were going to put on another fireman and I had a decision to stay with the fire department to go to the police department. And the police department at that time paid a little more than the fire department did, and uh, all my training that I had received at that time, working full time for the town, was fire department training. We got all our training with the states from, I'm from Charlotte. Ladder schools, smoke school, engineer school, I had certificates for all that stuff. 
And um, Pete really wanted, Pender really wanted me to stay on the fire department, and he had been sending me to school every time that I could go. And uh, it was a hard decision to make, but I decided to stay with the police department because I could take early retirement there, and that's what I did. I was, uh, I had about 18 years in when I retired, and all you needed was 15. And I retired when I was 50 years old and uh, was able to, and me and my wife and kids were gone, finished college. And we traveled for the next 10, 15 years all over the United States and wouldn't do it different. It's a bad decision financially, but I wouldn't change it. Being with her yeah, yeah. Uh, I, kids, I I hear when school groups come or or at the school and the fire the firemen are there with the truck and everything. Every once in a while, a kid will ask, "What is your favorite truck? Oh, yeah. Did you have a favorite truck or?" A... Well, like I say, uh, the nineteen twenty one American of France was part of the system. Yeah, but it was the last to be used and for a big fire where you wanted the uh, the power it had. And the 38 was uh, had a hail pump on it and it would moan and groan. It was so hard to uh, get water to it uh, off of the tank that was on it, a small tank. Hooked to the hydrant, she didn't have any problem, but a lot of times you were not close enough to a hydrant. And it was hard to prime, and it would moan and groan and go, with no water coming in. And the thing trouble was, if you put three men or four men on the tailboard, the front end was so white that you couldn't drive from ditch to ditch hardly getting to a fire because it was just like this. It was just barely touching the ground. So the workhorse was the fish. And uh, of course, when we got that house, we thought we died and gone to hell. That thing had a big water pump on it, and that big rocker shot me, and that thing just boom, 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 we're at 80 strong, basically, right now, oh, counting yeah. up uh, I'm, everybody, I'm administration. So, I'm so proud of our, our, our department. And for years, I'd go by there, all my friends, you know, and, and I was welcome. But the fact is, I helped, uh, I helped Doug build the building. I put in several days and work, and Ralph Cloninger and some of the people that were not full paid firemen at that time, you know, they helped and uh, I don't know when the volunteer system finally just played out. I couldn't answer that. But it, they slowly went from a volunteer department to a full paid department and I am really proud of our fire department. And, uh, but at some point in time, busy with the training that they do now, and everything changed so much. It wasn't a good idea to go by there and visit like we did for years and years and years. And I miss that. <laughs> I miss that. Yeah. But it, uh, as most of the guys that I knew, uh, when we were all there together in Oak City Hall building, or, yeah, they're they're retired. Yeah. They're retired. Uh, the. Uh Oh, I forgot. I forgot a question that a kid that I hear kids ask a lot. Uh, uh, well, at City Hall, I, well, before, of course, when you refer to City Hall, you're referring to the old City Hall when the yeah, that was on Main Street. Now, I was never connected with the fire department, police department, and the jail that was on Broad Street. Yeah, I was familiar with it, but I never spent any time there. By the time I went on, I don't remember. That city hall building was built, what, 52? Somewhere in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and we were all there, water department, street department, fire department, police department, highway patrol, sheriff's department, jail, and the whole thing, and it was a close, close knit bunch. One or two highway patrolmen at the most, two deputy sheriffs in the whole end of South Ireland, Tom Thompson and Dick Perkins, and uh, the for the sheriff's department, he didn't have when Lake Norman filled up. Charlie Rumpel was the sheriff, and he had about five men, including himself. Can you imagine that, Andy? I can't. Can I'm, you imagine that? I can't. That's amazing. It just uh, it's, it compared to the day now. It's just just unreal. But we mm -hmm. all worked together, and uh, what one didn't have, the other department could do. And, yeah. We had some tough times uh, with uh, yeah. in the late sixties, like everybody did. And we'd have to call on the sheriff's department; they had better equipment than we did on the police department and the fire department. And I knew one Sunday morning uh, that we had uh, well, it wasn't Sunday morning, it was Sunday afternoon, and uh, movie theater was still a viable thing on Main Street. And, we had a warrant, a felony warrant, to serve, and one of the off-duty police officers came by and told me that this guy was down at the theater getting ready to go in to see the movie on Sunday afternoon. And um, I called the cars and we got the warrant, and the cars, two cars went down there to arrest this guy, and it turned into a real bad, bad situation. A real bad situation. And the firemen were issued a firearm, it was a lightweight 38 Smith and Wesson five shot. And they were sworn in to back up the police department at that time because it's such a few of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went back to the fire department, P.R. Deaton and uh, Ron Wilson. I don't know his mom, maybe, but those are the two I remember. And I told him, I said, guys, the car's outside here on the lot. Uh, and go down there, the guys need help. And that's just the way it was back in those days. Everybody yeah. helped everybody else. Yeah. Well, Moore's was a lot smaller. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, oh, I remember. I've I've heard several kids, and I know it's different today. But in but then, how did you determine what to send to a fire, and how, you know what trucks you needed, and all that? I know well, today a lot of that's done by computers and things. It but was left. It was left to the driver and his uh, partner in the truck when they got to the scene. And this is a strange thing about fires. Yeah, knows what I'm talking about. Every fire has a smell. Industrial fires, house fires, wood fires, yeah. manufacturing fires, fire deaths, everything. When you get close, you can and you see the smoke. And sometimes you see the flame. Well, when you see that, you know that you're going to have to stop the truck and let somebody off if you got anybody riding on the tailboard, that's what he did. You stop the truck and you put a loop around the hydrant with the two and a half inch hose. And you get off with your wrench. And as soon as the truck moves on, it comes, runs right out of the bed of the truck. Well, as soon as the driver gets to the scene of the fire, he immediately comes off with the hose clamp and clamps off the two and a half inch hose because the guy back at the hydrant, as soon as he can take the wrench and turn the uh, cover off and hook the two and a half inch hose to the, to the hydrant, mm -hmm. then he gets on top and turns the water on. And that water comes right out of that hydrant and zips right up to the truck. And if you don't have a hose clamp on it, you've got a problem. <laughs> Which has happened, but, but it was their decision, nobody else's. 
And believe it or not, back in those days, a man like Ralph Eady that had been uh, there for 38 years when he retired, he knew about where everybody lived. He knew where all the hydrants were and the call boxes. And the decision was theirs to make. Now, if they would go to a fire and not hook a hydrant, and after they got there, then the fire became more involved, which happened one time with me on Statesville Avenue. We had a gin fire. And the first responder truck went down to the gin and the thing really got involved in a cotton fire is a terrible fire. We had Scott Air Packs, but as a general rule, it's not like the guys are now where they ride with them and they got them on. Uh, we had to go get them out of the compartment, and you was tough. Everybody was tough, you know. And uh, that truck went down there and then hooked to the hydrant up there at uh, Guns, no, what gun was Walnut, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so Fred Hudson was the uh, captain, and he says, guys, we've got to have water. Pull the hose off. Now, you talking about a mess. You start off with that two and a half inch hose, and there's two or three or four or five of them, and up the hill you go, and every time a section of that hose comes off that truck with the couplings, it gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And I never will forget, we got as close as from me to you to that hydrant, and every one of us passed out right there on the ground. Couldn't pull it another foot. And here comes some fresh, <laughs> fresh hands and got hold and got hooked to that thing. And that was a mean booger now, I'm going to tell you. That, that cotton smoke will choke you to death. That's just another story. <laughs> <laughs> like I say, I can sit here all day long and talk stories. But I, I, I think everybody in Lordville has got in his brains at all. They're really proud of our fire department and what's happened with the Come a Train long way. And the whole bit is, is just wonderful. Come a very long way. Oh, yeah. Oh, very yes, long. it has. Since I've been, I've been here 14 years. That long. Huh? And I, when I come, of course, it was one station. Yeah. And so now look at us now. We're at four stations, yeah. 80 people. Yeah. And you got, and, and more on the drawing board. Yeah. And you yeah. Know, we're looking at another two stations in the next few years. So. I've seen a. I've been very unfortunate that I'm getting to see all these changes in my career, yeah. and it's a shame that we have not done something like this earlier, yes, because there's a lot of good information out there we will never get, like off of yeah. Captain Field. Yeah. I mean, that's such a shame because, see, he remembers. He remembers as old guys. I mean, really old guys. Mm -hmm. I've got a list I made out yesterday. I sit there and. Of these people, and uh, we had carpenters, mailmen, lawyers, painters, textile workers, and just on and on. And on. Florist, <laughs> Claude Rogers was a, a automobile man, and I never will forget when the Chevrolet place caught on fire. Our brothers, yeah, and it was a mean booger. We stuffed down the stairs, and we all got there. We were really afraid to open the building up because of, we didn't know we was going to get a back draft or just the whole place was going to blow up. Wow! And Claude went in there and drove new automobiles that was down and being worked on down underneath the building, and he actually went in there and drove those cars out. It was a, it was a, it didn't burn up. Wow. Wow. It didn't burn up. <laughs> so we must have done something right. No, oh, yeah. <coughs> but uh, Paul Marr yeah. run uh, 
and Emmett, his brother, and his son, uh, their brother-in-law, uh, uh, and just Bill, uh, what his name? he just died recently, married to one of the Howard girls. But anyway, he had two, Paul, Paul, Howard. Was, on, Paul was on the fire department. Lewis Robinson was a uh, television man, was on the fire department. And Bo Thompson worked there, and he was on the fire department. And I remember one day we went down Main Street and got to Center Avenue, and the truck slowed up. Now, it didn't stop. We was going south. And Lewis and, and Bo and Paul jumped on the back of the truck. <laughs> to go to the fire. Yeah, that's something that. And Jimmy Howard uh, was uh, down under family from Mr. Hope's house. Joe Gilly, running board with fire bill, he was married to a drum that owned it, the whole thing. Yeah. And I worked with him a lot of times. Wow. Yeah. Harry Hobbs was a professional painter. J.W. Hager was working for the Tribune and sold automobiles and stuff. So mm -hmm. it's just uh, Rome Christie. He got into the carpet business, Salem Carpet Company, and they, uh, Lowe's, went uh, into the carpet business. Yeah. They hired Rome, and Rome's dead now. About everybody on that list has been gone. I've lived too long. I've outlived my peers. Rome, Rome uh, retired from Lowe's as a very wealthy man. He had that wonderful pension plan they had. You know. Wow. Uh, it's, to be associated with people like that, it was, yeah. it was a great thing. And I wish I could really tell you how you felt. Yeah. But most people, most people never, ever, in their whole entire life, get a rush that a fireman does, and the adrenaline and, and the the feeling of the people that are that are around you, you know, and that you're going to accomplish something and you're going to do something wonderful for people that can't help themselves. And that's what it is. Wow. That's what it's all about. Do you agree? You're, you're exactly 100% right. Yes, sir. Very and good it, never, it never leaves you. I don't care when I, yeah. when I leave here, if I've got my right mind, I'll always remember it. And you can't describe it. I can't really describe it to you. I yeah. don't know what you've done in your lifetime, but you've probably never been close to that. And maybe you have. Yeah. But most people do not. Yeah. The closest you get to that are people that get their kids riding motorcycles, driving a race car, uh, skiing down a mountain, that type of thing. It's the same thing. But most of us can't do that. And I was so proud. <laughs> How can you put it? <laughs> that I was one out of 30. One out of 30. And when I went on the police department, I was one out of 14. Wow. That's all we had. And when I left there 15, 16, 17 years later, there wasn't but 24. What is it now, Tim? It's, it's over 70. Yeah. Uh, after as far as fire suppression, then we're right around 80 with the administration and everything. And the technology there has changed just like it has in the Oh, yeah. Park. And technology Guys riding around with that. a computer in the car and everything. Yeah. Don't ride on the back no more. Can't do that. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. no. It's I long. never will forget we went across Tim Deal was driving, and Jim Torrance was in the front, and we had a call off of West Wilson Avenue on Alexander. And the call came in from a neighbor says there's an old lady in the house that is uh, bedridden. And she has nobody but her neighbors, and we check on her. 
and there's smoke coming out of the house, do hurry, come quick. And that's what you always heard on the phone, you know, was, please come quick, the house is on fire. And I was on the tailboard, and when we went off of Main Street across Broad Street, and that truck went up like that, and that was the old 51. And that thing landed down there on Broad Street. I was on that bar, but my feet was back. <laughs> but when we pulled up in front of that house, uh, Jimmy Torrance and I got off the back and went inside, and that poor old lady was in that bed, and I had a great fire, and the cold had rolled out of that grate onto the floor and was sitting there just smoking and getting ready to do its thing and thank goodness we were able to take care of her and uh, moments like that you never forget because you really did something good and I learned one thing I had heard all of my life why did it take you so long Fifteen minutes after the call went in and the truck's still not here. What were you doing? Were you playing checkers or something at the fire station or were you busy and just couldn't get in the truck? I don't want and on and on and on and on. You heard that all the time. But we had a time clock. And every call that came in that police and fire department, the first thing you did was stuck it in that time clock and stamped it. Well, I went to work one morning about 6 o'clock, and we were working 16-hour days at that time, off one day and on the next. And Larry Swain stepped outside, and he says, Henry, we just got a call up on Pine Street, and they really don't know what we need up there or whether we really need anything. How about jumping in the car? and going up there and see what's going on and call back. And I said, okay, so I jumped in the car and went up Church Street and got up there on time. And when I got there, I went to the front door. We had a fire. We had another cold break fire. But nobody at home. And the neighbors had called in because they saw, saw smoke. So I stepped to the car, picked up the mic, and I called headquarters. And Larry answered the phone and I said, get the boys down from upstairs. They were upstairs and had to come down steps. And get the truck and get it up here as quick as you can. It's, it's, it's closed up now and it hadn't really busted loose but all it needs is a little air. Well, I sit there on one foot and I sit there on the other foot and I said, what in the world are they doing? I heard the alarm go off, heard that old horn go boom, boom, and then I heard the siren coming and it, it, never, it never got there, it never got there, it never got there. And finally they pulled up and we had a what we call a red line, I guess it was a three quarter inch hose, so real hard, real, on the reel, and it was pre connected. And all they had to do was just start the pump, you know. And I reached up and got that red line and went on the porch, opened the door, and, shoo, 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 and it was all loud. It had burned down through the floor, now underneath the house. But it was a real easy, but right there is when I learned that these stories that people kept telling you it took so long, it felt like an eternity. Well, it's still today that way. <laughs> you just can't believe it. it, 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 it. But you got absolute proof back at the station. Okay, the call came in. There it stamped. The truck left here. Three minute response time. Honestly. Yeah, that's that's close that's, to the fire station. That's that way right now. And uh, Jimmy Torrance uh, came down those steps one night and broke his foot. They made a miss on them old steps. We didn't have a pole, and they had to come down, and the dispatcher had a button there, and you'd go boop, 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 boop. And as soon as you heard their feet go bam like that, then you went outside and put the wheel 
so the volunteers could get there. And you did that as quick as you could because you needed the volunteers there with the truck. And he broke his foot and we had a terrible fire up on the off of Statesville Avenue in the uh, black section of town. Yeah. And those little houses, they were really burned. And that thing was up in the sky. And we hooked that hydrant, and he hobbled up there and worked that fire. Of course, he wound up in the hospital because he messed his foot up real bad. Mm -hmm. So things like that, you know, it's dangerous business. Yeah. Uh, here's a, this is a little side trivia question. But the Morsel Parade, how did the how did the the fire trucks get to be in the Morsel Parade as you the know, lead? I really don't know what started that, but the uh, the old American in France was always a big hit with the children, you know, and the clowns. Yep. And we take that we had these little old Indian fighters, which was a was a tank that you put on your shoulder to fight brush fires, and it had a pump nozzle like this. Right. And it pumped that water out of it, and it was called an Indian firefighter. And it was mounted on all of our old trucks. And it's the meanest thing you ever, ever had your hands on. I mean, it would whip you down to you couldn't. But those clowns, that they were running around the fire truck in the parade, and I never will forget. And they wanted something to entertain the crowd. And one, one bright soul on the back of the truck says, Let's squirt them little devils with one of them Indian tanks. And we got started, and that was a highlight of every parade from there on. The clowns loved it. You know, they dodge around and you squirt a little water. <laughs> but how it started, Andy, I'm really not sure. But the police department and the sheriff's department, the highway patrol, and everybody was involved in it, and they loved to run them sirens. <laughs> They do. They come at the beginning of the parade and sweep it down. You know, just sirens and sirens. sirens. Well, you can yeah. tell a fellow like me's got diarrhea in his mouth and I would never run down. But. <laughs>